Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Calvary Laramie. It's great to see you this morning. I have a few announcements to get us underway here. First off, if you're new with us and would like us to get in touch with you or to get in touch with us, or if you have any prayer requests or praise reports, um, we have these comment cards that you'll find in the seat backs. It's just a way, like I said, for us to be able to get in touch with you, um, get some information for you. Or if you do have a prayer request that you put on there, just so you know, it'll get passed out to our prayer team throughout the week and prayed over in that way. So um, just, yeah, utilize that. If you fill one out, drop it. We have an agape box at each doorway. Um, you can drop those off there. And then we have... If you have any tithes or offerings with you this morning, those can go in the agape boxes as well. We also have a couple mobile giving options, if that's more your speed, either through um, the YouVersion app on our events page. Um, On our event today, you'll find a giving link all the way at the bottom, and then you can also find a giving link through our website if you need to utilize that. Some kids uh, ministry, children's ministry announcements for you. Um, if, If your children are in the nursery, that is just so that's basically ages zero to three or whatever um there in if you go down the hall through the red carpet room that's where our nursery is and then um the nursery is or the red carpet room is our is our cry room um our tykes and army class so ages three and up head downstairs our tykes class is in the downstairs classroom and then our army class um ages basically if your child can read to age 12 they're in the main fellowship hall Uh, downstairs. Uh, We also have, if you want to utilize a teen study guide that we pass out, it just is kind of a map through, fill in the blank type question, answer page, if you would like to follow along with the sermon notes today. Other things going on outside of church, um, our going deeper study on Wednesday nights, just a time that where, where we t- a time that we take to get together, fellowship, and also discuss deeper what we're what we're learning on Sunday morning. So if you are interested in that, there is a study guide that goes out for that via email. And if you want that, just put going deeper on one of these uh, with your email, and you'll get added to that list. And then those are wins that we meet Wednesday nights at 7, not at the church, usually at Leroy and Margie's home. And like I said, fellowship and talk about Sunday morning's study. Also, we have a volunteer meeting coming up Sunday, October 23rd. That'll be after service. If you're interested in serving at all at Calvary Laramie, we have various areas uh, where we, ha- we utilize volunteer, min- volunteer service, volunteer ministry um, for that, either th- in our children's ministry church cleaning, worship team, sound booth team. We also have some administrative needs, if that's your gifting. And then we'll also be having a winter shoveling, snow shoveling sign up as well, if you're interested in that. So just be in prayer about that. Come October 23rd, if you have any questions about serving here, we would love to have you. Also, uh, we'll be planning, we're planning our kids' Christmas worship service that'll be december 18th sunday december 18th it's the week before christmas it'll be and if you would like to participate that if your children would like to participate in that they'll be meeting thursdays here at 5 30 for practice so just to plug that and then i believe we have we'll probably have Jaden, do you have a clip for Operation Christmas Child? Awesome. So we'll just have that. We're launching our Operation Christmas Child um, shoeboxes again this year. If you, uh, if you don't know how it works, you can either talk to me or talk to Judy. We can get you more information, answer more questions. Um, but if, if you want to grab a box, you are welcome to grab a box today. And Judy, do you know what the turn-in date is for those? I was in November 16th. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So mid-November is the turn-in date for shoe boxes. So if you want to grab one, fill it up, and then bring it back to church, we would. We. I mean, it's it's a great ministry to be able to be a part of and, and help support. So there's that. I'll leave this and then turn it over to you. We have very unique transportation modes to transport the gift boxes to the children. We have canoes. We have what we call a donkey car. 
and we also have trucks. And then we have humans that are carrying the gift boxes to different places. My name is Grace. I'm the logistics coordinator for Operation Christmas Child Namibia. I am responsible for ensuring that the gift boxes get into the country and into the hands of the children. When the gift boxes arrived at the port, inspection is done by the customs officials. We always prepare prayerfully so that the hearts of the customs officials are kind and soft towards the projects. Once the customs officials clear the gift boxes, then the gift boxes get to be released. Once the gift boxes are released, we load them onto the trucks. The trucks transport the gift boxes to the different regions. The regional teams receive the gift boxes, and that's how the ministry partners receive the gift boxes, and then they get to distribute the gift boxes to the children. So this whole process involves a lot of volunteers, and it involves a lot of dedication. Our prayer request is for the safety of everybody that is involved in transporting the gift boxes, for God to bless them and for them not to give up helping us in this process. Let's stand and go to the Lord in worship today. Hallelujah. 
like rain falls down on me. Hallelujah, all my stains are washed away. Hallelujah, grace like rain falls down on me. Hallelujah, all my stains are washed away. They're washed away. come and worship you, that we can set aside all the things that, Lord, that just keep us from you, Lord. Lord, you have washed away our sins. You've made us white as snow, Lord God, and we just pray that you will be with us, Lord God. Help us, Lord, to listen to the words you want to speak to us today, Lord God, through this worship time, Lord, in song. Lord, help us to hear your voice speaking to our hearts, Lord God, as we so we bring our sacrifices of praise, and then, Lord, as we go into the rest of the service, Lord, I just pray that you would help us to continue to focus on you. Help us to tune into your presence. Lord, we know you are here. Help us to act that way. Help us to be your church in Laramie. Help us to, help us to change. Help our hearts to become pure, Lord, and made new today. Lord, we praise you. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise the Spirit. 
Spirit three in one. Oh, praise Him. Oh, praise Him. Alleluia. 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 Oh, Alleluia. Alleluia. Oh, alleluia.
Lord, I just pray as we continue to go on, Lord God, as we fellowship with each other, as we hear your words spoken through Pastor Nate, Lord God, I just pray that you would bless the rest of the service, have your way, Lord, make it fully yours, 
Lord, that we would not leave here the same, that you would change our hearts, Lord God, that you would change our lives. And Lord, if we do not, if we don't humble ourselves, Lord God, if we don't worship you, if we don't give these sacrifices of praise to you, Lord, we, Lord, we fully lose out on why we come to church, Lord. We, we don't just come here to be entertained. We don't just come here to hear a pastor shout at us, Lord God. We come to experience a, a living God who wants to live and work and have a relationship with us. And I just pray, Lord, that you would help us, Lord, to focus on you, strengthen us for the week, Lord, so that we can go out and reach the lost, Lord, that we wouldn't just take what you speak to us today, Lord God, and leave them in these these four walls, Lord God, but that it would be something that lives in our lives, that would touch the lives around us, Lord, our waiters and waitresses, our family members, our friends, our co-workers, Lord, that they would see something different in us, Lord. We just thank you for all these things, and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Go ahead and go around and welcome some, somebody in the Lord. Well, good morning. Whew. Once again, I um, have a couple very silly dad jokes for you to share this morning. Um, first off, you know one of the most amazing inventions in the last hundred years is the dry erase board? They're so remarkable. Yeah. 
Yeah. And then I heard this other one that went something like this. This is like talking about keeping a picture of your wife and kids in your wallet so then you know the reason why there's no money in it. (laughs) Anyways, those are just a couple of silly little things to have your ear this morning. We're going to be picking up our study in the book of Jude. We've been, I think, four weeks in the book of Jude now. And we're going to be looking at verse 6 this morning. It's towards the end of your Bible. You can also follow along if you're on the YouVersion app. Um, on our, if you go in the events section, you should be able to find us there, Calvary Laramie. All of the, my outlines in there, all of the supporting verses and notes and quotes are at your disposal if you would like to utilize that. I'm going to pray for us, and then we are going to dive into our study. Lord, thank you for this morning. I thank you for the book of Jude. I thank you for your foreknowledge on on everything, but specifically how it pertains to, to our day and how you wanted to write. You wanted to give us confidence as we live in these last these last days before you're coming and and as we face apostates and apostasy in the church uh you you urged jude to write us this letter so that we might be encouraged i pray lord that as we explore the other parts of Scripture that, that Jude is going to lead us into this morning, that we would be willing to take you at your word, trust you, and learn what it is you have for us, that we might be willing to humble ourselves in your presence. Um, I thank you for teaching us through your word. Use it. May it go forth and bless those who hear. In Jesus' name, amen. Just to give you a brief introduction, kind of where we're at. Last week we began our look at uh, kind of this three-verse section where we've kind of we made some progress and then we've slowed down to take these kind of one at a time in verses 5, 6, and 7 where we see Jude pulling from Old Testament record in order to give us three examples of apostates and and what apostasy might look like within these three contexts. In verse 5, he uses the example of the Israelites in the wilderness after their divine deliverance out of Egypt and how they basically fell short of, of inheriting all that God had for them because of their unbelief. They were unwilling to take God at his word that he had promised to deliver them into the promised land and to give them an inheritance, but they were unwilling to take God at his word and in their unbelief perished in the wilderness. Second, we see this, the the next example of these angels who sinned in verse 6. We're going to be looking at that in depth this morning, and then the final example in verse 7 of Sodom and Gomorrah. And as we look at these three brief verses from Jude, it gives us, a, as Bible students, as Bible readers, an opportunity to then go back and search the scriptures in order to learn, uh, to better learn from the record that God has given us and grow in our own walk with the Lord, learning how we can better walk in truth. With these examples of falling away from the truth given to us, we now are encouraged to walk in the truth. Jude, as he begins, verse 5, states his motivation behind these references, and he wants to invite us as the reader to call to mind those things which we might have forgotten. He writes in verse 5, But I want to remind you, though you once knew this, So these are things that we should be familiar with, have in the back of our mind, but Jude wants to bring it to the forefront of our minds. That the Lord, having once saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed those who did not believe. And the angels who did not keep their proper domain, but left their own abode, he has reserved in everlasting chains under darkness for the judgment of the great day. As Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them in a similar manner to these, having given themselves over to sexual immorality and gone after strange flesh, are set forth as an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. So Jude is just on the outset of these three verses wanting to remind us. And so with that kind of 
in the back of our minds, we took the opportunity last week, we're going to also take the opportunity this week to examine those Old Testament, we're going to go back into the Old Testament to mine the truths that are given for us there. And Last week we did it with Israel, examined them in the wilderness. We kind of used Paul's commentary in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 as a template. We worked our way through there and looked at the importance of God's people being willing to take God at his word, believe him, and trust in him. Israel didn't do this. And their failure to trust God, even with The ironic thing about Israel is that even with extreme evidence, incredible evidence of his miraculous work on their behalf, they were unwilling to take the next step and trust God that he was able. And so their unbelief becomes a warning for us to run the race with endurance, to not give up, to not fall out of the race, but to keep running with Jesus. Hebrews 12, 1 and 2 is a great reminder of, of this principle, to run the race with endurance. David Gusick writes, the warning through Jude is clear, that the people of Israel started out from Egypt well enough. They had many blessings from God along the way, but they did not endure to the end because they did not believe God's promise, promise of power and protection. So Israel is the example of unbelief and a lack of trust in God. Hebrews 3.12, also referencing Israel in the wilderness, encourages us in this way. Beware, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. So just to give you kind of a summary of verse 5, God can be trusted. His word can be trusted. But if we cannot take him at his word, we will fail, we will fall. We will end up stranded in the wilderness of unbelief. And so, we, so then taking that, and if Israel is given to us as a warning against unbelief, then the angels we're going to be looking at today are an example for us of what happens when we rebel against God. So verse 5, we'll read into verse 6, but I want to remind you, though you once knew this, that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed those who did not believe, and the angels who did not keep their proper domain, but left their own abode. He has reserved in everlasting chains under darkness for the judgment of that of the great day. Just to give you kind of the roadmap for this morning, we're examining the apostates, the angels that sinned, We're first going to be setting the stage a little bit, looking at this verse 6 as an opportunity to go and explore Scripture and other parts of of the Bible. It is strange content on the outset. I'm willing to admit that. This is a strange passage that we're delving into. And we're going to be looking at three different approaches to kind of the interpretation and application of this verse. Secondly, we're going to be looking at Satan's fall. We're going to be going back into Isaiah chapter 14, Ezekiel 28, and we might even um, head to, to Revelation chapter 12 as exploring these instances in Scripture where we're given insight into the fall of Satan from heaven and taking some brief notes and lessons from that. We're also going to be heading back to the beginning and Uh, Genesis chapter 6 and examining this phrase, the sons of God, and examining this group and their rebellion and how they stepped outside of God's design. And then hopefully we'll be able to close with some some good application this morning and, and being able to, I think that we're also able to draw some modern day application from this verse. So hopefully it'll be something that like is real tangible. We can hold on to it as we close this morning. But anyways, like I said, before before studying these brief verses in, in Jude, it gives us the opportunity to go and to explore the relevant parts of Scripture from where Jude is drawing these illustrations. Jude is writing his letter. He, he's anticipating the maturity of the reader that, hey, 
you should be able to make some connections in your mind with what Jude is referencing. He doesn't go into a whole lot of background. He just lays it out there like, hey, you know what I'm talking about, right? And so if we don't, then we should take this as an opportunity to go and figure out what it is that Jude is talking about. Today's passage also provides us with some very strange content, like I said, to, and, and to consider. It's also a cool opportunity to delve in some of the more obscure and mysterious passages in the Bible. I think that this stuff is very cool. I hope that you do too. With that being said, there are differences of opinion, and we won't have all of it sorted out until... We get to heaven, we sit down under Jesus, and he is going to walk us through scripture and teach us all things. So, there are different approaches to this. Scholarly, there, there's been scholarly deba- debate on this verse for a long while. We can disagree, but still remain in community with those we disagree with. A great rule of thumb One of my favorite sayings from from Pastor Alistair Begg is that the main things are the plain things and the plain things are the main things when it comes to Scripture. And those are the things that we need to agree on. How is a person saved? the, the, The fact that we're all sinners, we're all in need of a Savior. How is a person saved? Through Jesus Christ, His blood atonement on the cross. All of those those base founding principles of of Christianity and and the scripture are things that we should rally around and agree upon. This falls into another category of kind of being something on the side that we can do a lot of reading and a lot of study on. We might not come to a, a conclusion that's agreed upon by everyone, but that's okay because it's not a founding tenet of the faith, something that's essential for salvation. So, it gives us that opportunity. It gives us an opportunity to peek into the, also into the, the spiritual realm, where good and evil are at war and contending for the hearts and souls of, of mankind, really. And uh, a caveat on that, when, we, when I say that, don't view it as this struggle of equals, Satan is not God's equal. Satan is not Jesus' equal. He is a created being. He is below God and Satan and Jesus. And so the caveat, just keep that in the back of your mind as we're examining the struggle in the heavenly realms, the struggle between good and evil. God will one day be victorious over all. Satan will one day be defeated. They are not equals. We're going to be seeing that um, he is, in fact, a created being. His forces of evil do battle against humanity and work behind the scenes to try and thwart God's plan and destroy God's people, destroy humanity in general. John 10.10, Jesus kind of contrasts his ministry with, with how Satan goes about doing his business. He says, the thief does not come except to steal, to kill, and to destroy. He says, I have come that they may have life, and that they may have it more abundantly. So with that being said, it's also important at the beginning of today's study, we'll, I'll just lay out for you quickly um, the three approaches to Jude verse 6. The first approach is the cop-out view. This approach says we only look at verse 6. We aren't meant to know anything else about it, so we just read it and move on. Approach number two says that the reference here is to the angels who rebelled with Satan, that We have that record in Isaiah 14, Ezekiel 28, Revelation 12, and that those angels who fell, that's who is in reference to this, that they, they, we read in Revelation 12 that, that with Satan, a third of the angels went with him and were cast out of heaven. And so though that third of the angels, they were willing to follow the first great apostate himself, Satan, and that this is, their, this is the reference to that event only, and that in reference to their rebellion. The third approach, and, and I have to confess to you that, that I didn't fully grasp whether 
So, so the third approach gives us the opportunity to go a step further then and explore the passage in Genesis chapter 6 and this group that is identified as the sons of God who cohabitate with the daughters of men. And again, like I said, there's scholarly debate on the interpretation of that passage, but we're going to explore it. The part that I didn't fully grasp, and again, I'll probably be revisiting this passage a lot more to see if there is um, like a solid conclusion that you can come to, is whether or not a portion of that third of angels that fell are the ones that are referenced in Genesis 6, or if it's like another group that rebelled in addition to Satan and that third of angels. So, I, I don't know if there's an answer to that. I think that it's, it's fine to just take that Satan, a third of the angels fell, a portion of them are the ones referenced in Genesis 6 and who we read are actually from, from Jude, that they're, they're locked up. God has them in jail for since because of their rebellion and since that time until the judgment day. So those are the three approaches. Sin's approach number one doesn't give us a whole lot to work with. We're just going to jump straight into approach number two and examine the fall of Satan. So if you want to make your way in your Bibles, we're going to be looking at two specific passages, Isaiah chapter 14 and Ezekiel chapter 28. Within the chapters of Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28, the, the prophets Isaiah and Ezekiel are speaking about earthly kings and earthly kingdoms against whom God has pronounced judgment. But within these descriptions, the Holy Spirit also led them and he gives us a window into the spiritual direction and motivation behind these earthly powers while also using them as an illustration and as a comparison to Satan. In these prophetic illustrations, as is sometimes the case in Bible prophecy, there's a near fulfillment and a far fulfillment. So the near fulfillment, for specifically for Isaiah 14, is that Babylon will be judged and the fall of Babylon. The second, so in, and then in Ezekiel 28, the same is, is with, with Tyre and that kingdom. The far fulfillment is the ultimate judgment of Satan and his ultimate end that will take place as, as he will be cast out into the lake of fire for eternal judgment from God. So with that being said, Isaiah 14, starting in verse 12, we read, How you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning, how you are cut down to the ground, you who weakened the nations, for you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. Yet you shall be brought down to Sheol to the lowest depths of the pit. David Gusick writes about this passage in the prophetic habit of speaking to both a near and distant fulfillment, the, prof the prophet will sometimes speak more to the near or more to the distant. Here is a good example of Isaiah speaking more to the distant, ultimate fulfillment. It is true that the king of literal Babylon shined brightly among the men of his day and fell as hard and as completely as if a man were to fall from heaven. But there was a far more brightly shining being who inhabited heaven and fell even more dramatically, the king of spiritual Babylon, Satan. And so here in Isaiah, we get a glimpse, not only into Satan's fall, but we get a glimpse kind of into the motivation behind, well, his desire, and then why he had to be cast down, why he fell. And we see this mapped out for us in verses 13 and 14, within these five I will statements of Satan that we find there. Firstly, I will ascend into heaven. It was as if Satan said, heaven will be my home and my place of honor. Secondly, we read that 
I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will be enthroned and be exalted above all other angelic beings. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation. I will sit in the place of glory and honor and attention. I will ascend above the heights. I will continue to rise even in heaven until all see me in my bright and shining glory. And lastly, I will be like the Most High. I will be glorious and be set equal to God far above all other created beings. So within these five I will statements, we see that they're all motivated by pride. That pride was the ultimate motivator behind Satan's desires, and it became the catalyst for his fall. Proverbs 16, 18 reveals the folly of pride and its result. It says that pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Why was Satan or Lucifer so filled with pride? And I think that the passage in Ezekiel, if you make your way to Ezekiel 28, it gives us insight. So Isaiah 14 gives us insight into the heart posture of Satan. Ezekiel 28 really gives us his physical description and gives us insight into why he would think so highly of himself. So Ezekiel 28, 12 through 15. And it's interesting here because in 28, God is proclaiming judgment against the the prince of Tyre. And then as we move to this kind of middle point of the, the chapter, we see him declare this judgment against the king of Tyre. And so there's like, we see the prince of Tyre and then the king Satan as like the the motivation, the driving force behind this man, physical man on the earth. So verse 12, son of man, and that's just a title that that God gave to Ezekiel. It's very popular for God to reveal, refer to Ezekiel with this title in the book. So verse 12, son of man, take up a lamentation for the king of Tyre and say to him, thus says the Lord God. You were the seal of perfection, full of wisdom, and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering, the sardius, topaz, and diamond, beryl, onyx, and jasper, sapphire, turquoise, and emerald with gold. The workmanship of your timbrels and pipes was prepared for you on the day you were created. You were the anointed cherub who covers. I established you. You were on the holy mountain of God. You walked back and forth in the midst of fiery stones. You were perfect in your ways from the day you were created till iniquity was found in you. Satan himself, from from this passage, we gain kind of some insight into, into him. He was a being of great perfection, great wisdom, great beauty, one of God's finest creations, if not God's finest creation. And this fact stroked his pride and it fueled his rebellion against God. Once again from David Gusick, he says, Satan's sin was prompted by pride. With a swelled heart, drunk on his own sense of beauty and splendor, he made himself an opponent of God because God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. In the Ezekiel passage, if you, if you continue to read on, we're able to witness the progressive fall of Satan. First, he desires after God's throne. He desires to be worshipped like God. He desires to be exalted above his peers. Yet, he goes from being the anointed cherub who covers on the holy mountain of God. If, if you read So in Ezekiel and then also in in Revelation, we're given a picture to God's throne and the four cherubim that that are there in the midst of God's presence and and flying above his throne. More biblical scholars believe that Satan was one of these cherubs. He was a cherubim. God created him as one of the cherubim who was close to the throne of God. So he goes from being this anointed cherub who covers and, and on the holy mountain of God to being cast out from the mountain of God in verse 16. He's cast to the ground. We read in verse 17 of Ezekiel 28, we read that he's turned to ashes in verse 18 and eventually will be forgotten in verse 9. 
or 19, sorry. And so pride, if taking application, pride goes before the fall. Proverbs 16, 18, we're given the picture of that in how Satan conducted himself and the result. 1 Peter 5, 6 then express, expresses the true path to being exalted. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he might exalt you in due time. And if we want to, it, it's so cool to see, it was cool to me to see, that so we have this, the, I, I can't, for lack of a better word, the degression of Satan, regression, we'll call it, there it is, that's the word, the, to then comparing it to the example we were given of Jesus, in Philippians 2, and how he was... So Satan started out high, and he, he, will, he was brought low, and will eventually be brought to the lowest point. Jesus also started out high. But as we read in Philippians 2, so if you go to Philippians 2, verse 5, is where it starts, Paul is encouraging us to follow in the example of Christ, the example of humility. And... He then gives us Jesus moving from humility to exaltation instead of moving from being exalted and considering yourself high to being humbled. In verse 5, we read, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of those in heaven and of those on earth and of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Warren Rearsby writes, The whole purpose of Christ's humiliation and exaltation is the glory of God. And so we see a stark contrast behind Jesus' motivation that he was willing to be made low and he was willing to become a servant. He was willing to be subjected to death, even the humiliating death on the cross, in order that God might receive the glory. Satan desired after the glory that God receives. And he's only focused on himself. He's only filled with pride. And Satan's pride led to his rebellion. So then after, so, great kind of, what's lesson application right here? Humble yourselves before the Lord. Don't consider yourself as, as too good to go before God. Satan's pride led him to rebellion. But after that, after he and the angels who rebelled with him were were cast out of heaven, we see that his pride also stoked then his animosity toward God and also fueled his contempt for the human race. This leads us into this third approach. So that's the second approach that this verse is in reference to Satan and his demons, his fall from heaven, their fall. But then in addition to that, we go to Genesis chapter 6 and explore this third approach from Genesis 6. Now, it came to pass, verse 1, when men began to multiply on the face of the earth and daughters were born to them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were beautiful, and that they took wives for themselves of all whom they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not strive with man forever, for he is indeed flesh, yet is Days shall be 120 years. That's Verse 3 is a reference into how much time was left before the flood. Not that God was going to limit man's days to 120 years. Verse 4. There were giants on the earth in those days and also afterward when the sons of God came into the daughters of men and they bore children to them. Those were the mighty men who were of old, men of renown. Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth 
and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Again, I want to note that this passage has led to a lot of scholarly debate. There's not scholarly agreement on this topic. However, like I said, this does not need to divide us. One day Jesus will explain all things. Genesis 6, the sons of God, tra- translated from Hebrew, B'nai Ha Elohim. It's a term found four times in the Old Testament, here, and also in Jude or Job 1.6, Job 2.1, Job 38, 7. All four times, well, and, and this is where the scholarly debate comes in, but I believe in if, if you remain consistent, consistency is key. The three times in Job, it's referring to angels, angelic beings. So why would it not refer to that here? Chuck Missler observes that when the Greek Septuagint was translated three centuries before Christ, this term was translated as angels. So there was understanding back in the day that the sons of God that were are referenced here is a term for angels. The counter-argument is that the sons of God simply refers to the godly line of Seth, who is a son of Adam, and that that godly line had been given instruction to not cohabitate with the, godly, with the ungodly line, the rebellious line of Cain. And so that's kind of the, the other viewpoint on this passage. It's inter- some, some questions that would come up for me if you're approaching it that way is why would a simple, why would simply, why would the relationship between human beings, between Seth's line and Cain's line, make these monstrous beings, these giants that we read of in verse 4? For me, that kind of gives credence to this idea that these angels were rebelling against God, that they were engaging in the, this out of order, out of God's design relationship with mankind, and that that becomes the source for these giants, for these men of renown, these men of old. So, the motivation behind this action, this rebellion, God had promised that in Genesis chapter 3, the proto evangelum Genesis 3.15, God had promised that the Redeemer would come through the seed of the woman, and that through the seed of the woman, he would, that seed would crush the head of Satan. So, Satan hears that, and I think that he and his cronies are thinking, well, if we corrupt the seed, then the Messiah can't come. And so, a portion of them set out to corrupt the seed of man. And and. It's very interesting to note that that Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. So crazy kind of thoughts on on this passage is that these demonic beings came down, they corrupted the, 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 the seed of man, the DNA of man, and that Noah and his family were the only pure bloods left on the earth. And so that is why, that is kind of a, a, a reasoning behind why God chose Noah to be his representative, to be the one who he delivered out of, out of the judgment of the flood. And we see that, that the pattern of Scripture becomes, from, from the proto evangelium on, is that Satan and the spiritual forces of darkness are always in a, in, in a conflict with God's people and always trying to thwart the plan of God, either by destruction or here by, by this pollution of the gene pool. Relating this event back to Jude, we see here that the angels rebel against God and his established order. They step outside of God's design. Their re- rebellion is linked to some sort of sexual sin. And Jude connects that with the sexual sin of Sodom and Gomorrah in verse 7. Why is Jude even using this as an example? I think Warren Wearsby does a great job of speaking to this point. He writes, It is not necessary to debate 
the hidden mysteries of this verse in order to get the main message. What's the main message behind Jude verse 6? God judges rebellion and will not spare those who reject his will. If God judged the angels, who in many respects are higher than man, then certainly he will judge rebellious men. And so we see that as probably also a motivating factor behind Satan's rebellion is that he saw in himself and in the angelic beings God's highest creation. And so it doesn't make sense to him in his mind that God's highest creation would be tasked with serving and ministering to humans who he views as lesser than. And yet, in God's economy, he loves humanity more than the angels. And he has for us an end that that we will be exalted to even a higher position than the angels. And so for Satan, that just didn't make sense. And he's not willing to accept it. And so he sets out then as an enemy to humanity. And so then this becomes a good place as we're talking about application and and this finer point of God's ultimate judgment to transition then into some application. And in studying passages like this, it's, it's important for us to kind of reset at this point so that we don't miss the forest for the trees. Because you start getting into asking all these questions and exploring these obscure passages, and and you come up with more questions than you have answers, really. And so the the warning, I think, is it's it's a good one, to to not miss the forest for the trees. That the clear principle that Jude is trying to get across is it's a warning to us of God's judgment. And then kind of piggybacking off of, Paul's encouragement to us in 1 Corinthians 10, 12, that we ought to take heed lest we fall. These fallen angels are a warning to us. Pastor Matthew Mayer notes, if Satan can convince angels to leave heaven, he can convince humans into hell. So we have to be discerning. We have to be on guard because the spiritual forces of of darkness and wickedness are against us. Take heed, lest you fall. Satan has very convincing arguments. 2 Corinthians 11, 12-15, Paul speaks to this. But what I do, I also continue to do, that I may cut off the opportunity for those who desire an opportunity to be regarded just as we are in the things of which they boast. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into apostles of Christ. This, This is... The idea of apostate, that, the, that they put on a front. They, they were of us, they were among us, but not of us. Verse 14, and no wonder, for Satan himself transforms, transforms himself into an angel of light. Therefore it is no great thing if his ministers also transform themselves into ministers of righteousness, whose end will be according to their works. So take heed lest you fall. Be on guard. Exercise discernment. Another takeaway from Jude verse 6 is that these angels' end is certain. They are set to face the judgment of God. That's guaranteed, as are all who rebel against him. Something else that may be helpful and or frightening is to see if we can draw a modern-day connection with this passage and see... I, maybe we can interpret some modern day happenings of culture with using scripture. So with that being said, what is a modern takeaway that we can go to? Well, in Luke chapter 17, this is from Jesus himself in Luke 17, verse 26. He says, and just as it was in the days of Noah, so it will be in the time of the second coming of the Son of Man. The people were eating, they were drinking, they were marrying, They were being given in marriage. They were indifferent to God until the day that Noah went into the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. Warren Wearsby comments, Noah lived in days of religious compromise, moral declension, not unlike our present, and moral declension, not unlike our present time. 
During the days of Noah, population growth was significant. Genesis 6.1, lawlessness was on the increase. Genesis 6.5, and the earth was given over to violence. Genesis 6.11 and 13. Do any of those things draw a connection for us today? That, that lawlessness was on the increase. The earth has been given over to violence. As in the days of Noah, so it will be. Like It's like God is giving us warning signs before it happens. Before the rapture of the church, God's saying, hey, these are some clues, these are some hints before it happens. The earth, it's going to, be, it's going to look a lot like it did in Noah's day. What are we told? Genesis 6, that the thoughts and intents of man were only evil continually. As in the days of Noah. Another lesson we can draw is that, and this is from Matthew Mayer again, a departure from the divine design is a clear sign of the times. A departure from the divine design is is a clear sign of the times. In Romans chapter 1, Paul talks about the departure from God's standard, the departure from God's model, and that when mankind departs from that standard, God then removes his hand of favor from them, and this becomes a form of his judgment. God doesn't have to intervene in order to judge. We can, from Romans 1, we can see that all he has to do is just step out. One of, the, one of the scariest things ever said in Scripture is God turned them over. Just let them do whatever it was their rebellious hearts wanted to do. Romans 1 speaks to this. And in verses 24 and 25, it says, Therefore God also gave them up to uncleanness, and the lust of their hearts is this honor their bodies among themselves, who exchanged the truth of God for the lie, and worshipped and served the creature rather than creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. Today we not only see this taking form in the realm of the abortion agenda, the homosexual agenda, the transgender agenda, but also in the realm of what can be referred to as transhumanism. Attempting to fuse the consciousness of humanity with artificial intelligence. If you're not aware of it, look it up. Do some reading. Klaus Schwab, the World Economic Forum, Elon Musk, the, the, the big wigs of Amazon, Mark Zuckerberg, they're all wanting to get into this realm of creating this, this fusion of man and machine, trying to put human consciousness and to artificial intelligence. Why? In order to achieve eternal life. That they might not die. That they might attain immorality. Immortality. Sorry. Today the elite class of the world is trying to come up with that. How do we achieve immortality? How can we achieve everlasting life? I can tell you how. And it's not through artificial intelligence. It's through the blood of Jesus Christ. If you want, there, there's a cool Jan Markell episode. It's very recent from September 30th where they talk about in depth all of these things that are going on in our, in our modern culture. So as in the days of Noah, we, we looked at how Genesis 6, these sons of God came in to corrupt the, the human DNA, God's image bearers. The pattern is clear from Genesis 6. When God's image bearers are being altered, when we start tampering with the human DNA, God doesn't stand for that, and he will execute judgment. I think that it's a, a, an amazing sign of the time that we're living in. That, yeah, man has sinned for a long time, but what we're dabbling in today, it's dangerous, dangerous stuff, and God won't stand for it much longer. So then a good question to ask is, and what Jude is encouraging his readers to do, is to, to, to stand against apostasy. Stand against the evils. How do we stand against the evils in our world? I think, I think firstly, it's important to acknowledge that there, there is spiritual darkness, spiritual motivations behind 
what's going on today, to acknowledge that. And then to, and then to say, well, then how do I guard against that? Again, from Matthew Mayer, he, he says the only way to be guarded in heart is to be girded in truth. So with that being said, we'll flip to a familiar passage. And this is kind of where, where we'll close our time this morning. Talking about the whole armor of God. We're instructed to guard ourselves during these times. Be alert. Ephesians 6.10, Finally, brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all to stand, stand therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace, above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench the fiery darts of the wicked one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplications in the Spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. Paul's encouraging us, take up the armor of God, the belt of truth. May it be around you. May it be that item which holds all of the other things together. May you be rooted and grounded in truth, knowing that the truth of God's word is what? That my breastplate of righteousness does not come from me. It comes from Christ. He is, God has made me the righteousness of Christ through what he did. I am righteous before God in Christ because of his sacrifice, because of his blood that cleanses. The gospel of peace. How do we have peace in times of trouble? How do we have peace during the days in which we live in, where it just seems like everything and everyone is going against the pattern of how God created it? The gospel of peace, may it, may you walk in it. The shield of faith, do we believe and trust God? Does, does faith, do we, do we walk in faith? It's not just belief. Do I take action? Do I hear from God and trust him enough to then act? on what he's saying. The helmet of salvation. The battle place of your, the battleground of your mind. Don't 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 take the fiery darts of of the enemy without your helmet of salvation knowing that you are bought with a price, you are redeemed in Christ unto God. May it guard your mind. And the sword of the Spirit, our, our, our word, our offensive weapon that we take and we use against the spiritual hosts of, of, of wickedness. Take up the whole armor of God. We'll close just with some, a, a few thoughts from Warren Wearsby. It's, it's a bit lengthy, but really he does a great job of bringing everything around and giving us some, some application. What can we do practically to oppose the enemy and maintain the purity and unity of the church? For one thing, we must know the word of God and have the courage to defend it. Every local church ought to be a Bible institute and every Christian ought to be a Bible student. The pulpit needs to declare positive truth as well as denounce error. Be rooted and grounded in truth. Second, we must watch and pray. The enemy's already here and we dare not go to sleep. Spiritual leaders in local congregations need to be alert 
as they interview candidates for baptism and church membership. Committees need to seek the mind of Christ as they appoint Sunday school teachers, youth sponsors, and other church leaders. Congregations must exercise discernment as they select officers. Good, solid, sound leadership. Third, congregations and members must be careful where they send their money. Should you help the wicked and love those who hate the Lord? Finally, we must have the courage to maintain a position of biblical separation from those who deny Christ and the fundamental doctrines of the word. This does not mean that we separate from fellow believers over minor minor doctrinal differences or that we practice guilt by association. God's true army needs to stand together in the battle for truth. Lord Jesus, thank you for this morning. Thank you for your word. And even in the midst of, of, I don't know, interesting passages of scripture, Lord, I thank you that your your word is not boring, that you you give us (laughs) these really cool passages to look into and, and to fill our time with, that we might take our curiosity and stoke the fire of of study. And Lord, I pray that these exciting things would would just spur us on to read your word in order that we might know you more. Yeah, there's amazing things in your word. Yeah, it speaks to 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 realms that we cannot see and 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 times times past. But God help us help us to also be able to, to keep the, the main things as the plain things. Acknowledging that, that you loved us so much that you sent your only begotten son. For God so loved the world that whoever should believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So God, as we face down these dark days of the end, as we, as we live in a world of apostasy, help us to be rooted, grounded in truth. May, may you guard our minds with the fact of our salvation that you have purchased us at a price and you intend to redeem us. You have redeemed us and will ultimately one day redeem us unto yourself. Lord, I pray for anyone within the sound of my voice who may not have this, the, the secure helmet of salvation or be, be rooted and grounded in, in the gospel of peace. And if you haven't, if you find yourself in that place of unease, if there is, God, God's salvation is a free gift that is offered to anyone who would believe. And if you want it, there, so there's no secret behind, behind the prayer of salvation, but it is about your heart. Are you willing to humble your heart before the Lord? And say, Lord, you have paved the path of salvation, and I am willing to walk in it. To lay aside how my, my own self-righteousness, my desire to earn and deserve your love, my desire to, to perform good works in order to be saved, Lord, I put all of that aside and acknowledge that it's only by the blood of Jesus that I'm saved. If you would like to receive God's free gift of salvation, you can pray this heart, pray this prayer in the quietness of your heart or out loud. Dear God, I know that you love me. And I know that you want to save me. Jesus, you died to save me. And you promised to save me if I would trust in you. By faith, I receive you as my Lord and Savior. Forgive my sin. Cleanse me. Save me, Lord Jesus. Thank you for saving me, Jesus. 
I receive it by faith. I don't look for a sign. I don't ask for a feeling. I stand on your word, and that settles it. Now, Lord, would you begin to make me the person you want me to be? Fill me with your Holy Spirit. And help me, Lord Jesus, never to be ashamed of you. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you please stand?
May God bless you and keep you. Make his face to shine upon you. May he lift up his countenance and his grace. And my prayer is that the word of God that was declared this morning, that you might hear it and do it, might take heed to it. Don't be hearers only, as James says, but be doers. So consider what it is to... To, to be prideful before the Lord and, and humble yourselves in his presence that you might accept what it is that he has said about the deep and spiritual things, the, the status of, of man's heart that we're all sinners in need of a savior. Rebellion leads to judgment. May you not rebel, but draw near to him in humility so that he might lift you up in due time. In Jesus' name, amen.